And now today's featured speakers are Abubakar Dumbuya, class of 07, and Nevin Athwal, class of 14. The session will be moderated by Professor Jahangir Sultan. Dr. Sultan is the Professor of Finance and Founding Director of the Huey Center for Financial Services, the Trading Room at Bentley University. He teaches fixed income and international financial uh, management at the undergraduate and graduate programs. Dr. Sultan has published over 35 articles, some in prestigious journals. He received the 1999 Bentley University Scholar of the Year Award, and he is actively connected with the local and international finance professionals. Abubakar is an executive director in JP Morgan's Corporate Derivatives Marketing CDM Group, working with corporate clients in regards to interest rate and foreign exchange risk management. Based in New York, Abubakar covers companies across a range of industries and geographies. He is involved in the firm's recruiting and diversity initiatives and also serves as a mentor for students in Sponsors for Educational Opportunity, SEO, and the Fellowship Initiative, TFI. Lots of acronyms. Prior to joining JP Morgan in 2017, Abubakar spent 10 years working in a similar capacity with Bank of America in both Boston and Chicago. Nevin is an associate in JP Morgan's infrastructure finance and advisory team. Nevin works on structuring and executing infrastructure and project financings across the renewables, power, oil and gas, and energy sectors in North and Latin America. Prior to JPM, Nevin worked at SMBC in the debt capital markets group for two years. He was responsible for structuring and executing project bond financings for issuers in the Americas across all infrastructure sectors. Without further ado, please join me in virtually welcoming, thank you for your time today, Professor Jahangir Sultan, Abubakar Dumbuya, and Nevin Akwa. Thank you guys. Thank you, Emily and Bethany. Uh, you have really worked tirelessly to uh, organize this great uh, session. Uh, and today's uh, webinar really allows us to explore how Wall Street has um, responded uh, to multiple sources of crisis events, historical and transformative in nature. And these issues are, they have the potential of affecting us now and for generations to come. And these issues and events related to trade war, climate change, election, gender pay gap, the pandemic, global economic shutdowns and social unrest due to um, systemic racism, just to list a very few. Uh, we won't have time to cover all of those. Um, and I've taken a look at many questions. There are excellent questions. We will pick some of these uh, questions. Um, so overall, what we're looking at is a, a paradigm shift uh, in the world. And uh, we need to understand the implications of this paradigm shift and address where our intervention is needed. And uh, to that extent, we're very fortunate to have Abu Bakr and Naveen, two of our many successful alums working as executives on Wall Street. They will share with us their views on some of these issues, events, and especially their personal experiences. And uh, as we said, we have received many questions and, we'll and we have taken, selected some that will highlight the major points. We'll also be monitoring the Q&A box. And um, <clears throat> so uh, please feel free to add questions. To start off, um, Abu Bakr and Naveen, can you uh, briefly tell us about your incredible career journey? since uh, you graduated from Bentley University. Yeah, absolutely, I can start. Um, and I'll actually start a little before I graduated. So I uh, had two internships during my college career, uh, first after the summer of my sophomore year, and then after the summer of my junior year. Uh, both of those were with Bank of America, um, and I was able to get those internships by going through uh, SEO, Sponsors for Educational Opportunity. Um, so after my sophomore year, I interned uh, half sales and trading, half investment banking, um, got an offer to come back for both and decided that I liked the work and the lifestyle uh, and the culture and sales and trading a little bit better. And so I came back the next summer and did that 
uh, full time uh, uh, for that summer. And so both of these uh, internships were in New York. Um, so I got an offer to come back after I graduated uh, to start in New York. Um, I moved down to New York uh, in July of 2007 after graduation, started working. Uh, uh, and within 10 weeks, the financial crisis hit and they actually cut my entire group. Um, and so that was a little bit nerve wracking. I just moved down to the city, started my career, um, and they pulled all of us into a conference room and told us that um, our group would not exist going forward. Um, luckily, being part of the analyst program, they were able to find me another position. And so I moved up to Massachusetts to join uh, a derivative sales group there focused on interest rates. And so that's helping companies manage different types of interest rate exposures that they have. Uh, so I worked out of Boston for about five years, uh, and then an opportunity came up to move to Chicago. And so, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts, went to school there, and I've been living there. Uh, and I had my dreams of moving to New York uh, crushed really early into the experience. And so I thought it'd be nice to uh, move to a different city, get a little bit of a different personal and professional experience. So I moved to uh, Chicago for five years. I was there from 2012 to 2017. Um, and, and that was a, a really good experience. And so along the way, I was also um, uh, being promoted. So I went from analyst to associate and then from associate to VP, uh, which is great because not only was the city uh, changing, but also the type of work that I was doing was changing also. Went from doing so, sort of support analytical work to having my own clients that I was working with. Um, so I was at uh, Bank of America until 2017. And then I, I really started to think about where I wanted my career to go. Uh, and I looked at a lot of different options. Um, at one point, I looked at uh, moving back to West Africa and working at a startup there. Um, looked at some stuff uh, in Europe, thought a lot about going abroad. Um, and as I was thinking about that, I got approached by a recruiter from JP Morgan about a position uh, in New York. Uh, doing essentially the same thing. So interest rate derivatives and a little bit of foreign exchange uh, sales. Um, but the difference was that uh, I'd be working with bigger companies that give me a better platform. Um, and also I think there's a lot of benefits to being in New York uh, when you're in an industry that's uh, really headquartered here and you're around leadership and a lot of the innovation and idea generation that's happening. Um, so I accepted the offer, moved to JP Morgan and New York uh, in the fall of 2017. Um, and I've been here since, so it's been three years now. Um, and I've had a pretty good experience. Um, I had a great experience at Bank of America, um, but I think like with a lot of things in life, there comes a time when, when change is necessary in order to kind of make it to the next level. Um, and so uh, I think that was the change for me and, and it's been a good experience since. So uh, for me, uh, I think it kind of all started back in school where I was really interested in international finance uh, and Professor Ullman actually had a class uh, in project finance that he offered at the school, uh, which was pretty cool. And it helped me really hone my interest in the field, gave me an introduction into infrastructure. So I think my, my career probably can be summed up into, you know, three moves so far. Um, is you know starting my career in New York, um, trying to move to the city, and then uh, then going into investment banking, uh, specifically focusing on something more infrastructure related, and then lateraling into uh, J.P. Morgan in, in the infrastructure group. So the, for the first one, um, you know, coming out of school, uh, I had a couple internships, but they weren't. Um, they were just uh, more sales trading on the muni side, uh, administrative work. So uh, I was trying to see what I could get out uh, coming into a full-time job. And coming out of graduation, uh, I realized I kind of wanted to do something more infrastructure related um, just because I took that project finance class. So uh, that's where I landed at uh, Build America Mutual, which is a municipal bond insurer. So essentially, what uh, Build America does is that they're, the company is rated AA and they insure municipal bond transactions that are you know, lower rated. So if something is triple B, then they put their insurance on it and then it becomes AA, which helps with the marketing and execution and the pricing of the deal. So I started out there for two years and I was in the rotational program, uh, which is focusing on the underwriting and the credit surveillance side 
of their existing portfolio. Um, so I did that for about two years, part of like the analyst program. And then I think I really want to focus in doing something more infrastructure related um, on a national and global level. So that's when I transitioned to SMBC, um, which is a Japanese bank. And uh, I was on the debt capital markets group there. So I kind of had to transition from a place where I was doing more credit uh, insurance underwriting work to a traditional investment bank platform. So in order to make that move, uh, you know, there's a lot of preparation that has to go behind it and a lot of work. Um, people want to know that you could do it. Um, but I was able to kind of show and demonstrate my knowledge in infrastructure and able to kind of touch on the high points there. So from there, I was focused on uh, project bonds for infrastructure projects uh, in North and Latin America. So think of an infrastructure project as essentially uh, a large project that can ra raise its own dedicated financing. Um, and so those are the issuers and borrowers, and those are the clients that I work with. And then the sponsors who own the project are the, uh, are, you know, the personnel that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I was doing project bonds there for North and Latin America for about two years. And then uh, I was also approached at JP Morgan um, to maybe go into their infrastructure finance and advisory team, um, which I thought would be a great opportunity. The, the team itself uh, about two years ago when I joined was more of an, an upstart position. Uh, JP Morgan has recently over the last five to six years created this project finance group to respond to their uh, sponsor clients to uh, cater to their you know, infrastructure needs. And they were looking to expand the group out and we're still in growth mode right now. So I thought this was a good opportunity to kind of join and establish you know, a really good bank uh, and, and then maybe go into a, uh, a growth platform at an established bank. So it, it felt like a really good opportunity. And over here, uh, my role is more general where I work on both loan and bond financings for all infrastructure related assets, but then also um, help it on the advisory side where, you know, we, um, where we help the issuers and the sponsors navigate on how to actually build the project and how to finance it all the way from, you know, putting shovels into the ground to actually raising the financing. So it, it's been, uh, it's been a really good broad based experience here. Uh, and then I work with uh, the derivatives team, such as Abu over here, and uh, various counterparts in derivatives, M&A, equity, uh, to help structure these projects. Thank you. Uh, you both are on an upward trajectory. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really a testament to the outstanding academic and personal success of our students. And uh, of course, we'd like to take a lot of credit for it, but I know it, it's not possible without hard work, dedication, uh, and that you put in. But um, the faculty and staff at Bentley, we're extremely proud of you, very proud of you. So uh, let me structure this Q&A session as an informal chat, uh, you know, basically ask you questions and um, you can choose. Uh, uh, whether you want to answer, uh, one, one of you can answer or both of you can answer, it's very informal. So uh, uh, anything goes, okay. So the first uh, question that we have is more of a macro oriented. Um, and uh, so we're talking about uncertainty in the capital markets. You know, capital markets is all about uncertainty. So we have uncertainty due to all the issues that I mentioned earlier, election, trade war, global slowdown, social crisis, uh, racial injustice, pandemic. What goes through your mind when you look at this as a Wall Street executive? Um, I know it's a very broad question, but uh, we're, we're interested to know what goes on. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on this, these issues? Yeah, I, I can start with that. Um, so I think from a markets perspective, specifically where I'm in, um, whenever we think of uncertainty, we think of volatility, uh, and then by definition, we think of opportunity, right? And so um, if you're looking at it just from a corporate perspective, um, there's an opportunity now for stronger companies to assert themselves 
uh, and to look to look at strategic investments, M and A, uh, to put themselves in a position of strength going forward. Um, of course, that takes like prudent planning and prudent sort of uh, capital structure and balance sheet management in times where uh, you know the economy is going good, so that you're prepared uh, to take advantage of opportunities now. Um, and then from a market side, when it comes to trading, whether it's you know uh, uh, investment firms that are looking to uh, trade on their own behalf or companies that are looking to hedge, uh, there's again opportunity there, right? We're seeing pretty wild swings in different asset classes. Uh, we saw the big decline in the uh, equities market uh, earlier this year, and a lot of people were able to take advantage of that. Um, like for instance, you know, my group works with uh, uh, companies as they do share buybacks. And so companies that had a lot of cash on their balance sheet were able to enter the market uh, and buy back a, a significant amount of their shares at depressed prices, right? Companies that weren't um, in a good balance sheet position weren't able to take advantage of that because they were, able, they were trying to shore up cash. Um, so I think whenever anything like this happens, it, it creates opportunity. Um, it separates those that were prepared from those that weren't prepared um, and, and the strong from the weak. Great. Naveen, you want to respond? or uh... Yeah, and maybe I could just add that, you know, it's been interesting to also see how some of these clients are been reacting to the news in real time. Um, there's been so many events that happened throughout the year, as, as you mentioned, and it's been pretty interesting to see, you know, how the clients have been changing their business strategy or the perspective in facing um, these uh, events. So, for me personally, I've seen a lot of my clients uh, on the infrastructure side try to protect their liquidity and access to the market during these tough times back in April and May. Um, and, you know, it, it was uh, it was pretty, there was times where the market was inaccessible and there was a lot of uncertainty on how it would go going forward. So then in, you know, April, June, um, May, and the rest of the months, there's been a huge issuance of bond um, issue of uh, bond instruments, trying to shore up liquidity from the uh, client side, so they could protect themselves in the current conditions. But then also going forward, everyone's trying to think about you know what can happen uh, going forward. And you know, to be honest, it's kind of anyone's guess to come. Um, there's been a lot of uncertainty going forward, but you know, in terms of the companies, they I think everyone's just trying to prepare for the worst and raise this capital. That is correct. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are talking about what kind of recovery we're going to have, U-shaped, V-shaped, and, you know, so on and so forth, especially with the COVID. But uh, a lot of these things are driven mostly by the Federal Reserve, you know, with so much liquidity in the market. So the question that was raised is that, um, do you believe the Fed is going to remain on hold? Uh, in the short term or probably uh, in the intermediate term? Yeah, I, I think the Fed is going to be on hold for a while. <laughs> um, I think there's a couple of lessons that we can learn from the last financial crisis and uh, what their reaction was there. Um, so the first is that uh, they're going to err on the side of caution. Um, there's really asymmetric risk now in terms of them raising rates, um, especially in an environment where we're not seeing any inflation. Um, or at least there's no measurable inflation. It feels like everything in my life is getting more expensive every year, but uh, the inflation numbers seem to, to say otherwise. Um, but until there's measurable inflation and the Fed feels a need to raise rates, I think they're gonna err on the side of caution, continue to provide more stimulus in the economy. Um, and what we've seen is that there hasn't been too many negative um, kind of, uh, uh, consequences of them keeping rates low the first time around. A lot of people were worried about whether or not it would cause investors to go out further in the risk spectrum in order to gain return, uh, whether retirees would need to work for longer because the money that they've saved uh, wouldn't generate as much return for them. Um, and all of that seems to be okay. Um, you could also argue that it's fueling uh, and uh, sort of unprecedented and uh, maybe overvalued uh, increase in the stock market. Um, but I think, you know, based on the data that we're seeing now, it seems like uh, they'll keep rates on hold for some time, um, as long as there's not, you know, kind of too much uh, negative downside. So I, I'm, I'm in the camp that, you know, for another 
you know, three or four years, we'll probably see rates at the levels that they're at. Yeah, and uh, from my perspective, you know, just based on the news that I've been reading as well, you know, it's also, you got to also look what Congress is doing as well and see how they're reacting to this. And there's always a political battle when it comes to the stimulus package, unemployment benefits and things like that, right? But, you know, the Fed, I think, realizes it just can't be them. It also has to have some help from Congress as well. And it needs to be some kind of cooperation going forward. So you're, you're getting, it's, uh, I think when, it, when the Fed looks at its mandate and, you know, says we need to be lower for longer, they also kind of rely on Congress to also, you know, we need to think about what you guys are going to do because you need to help out as well. I think you're on mute, Professor. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the next, thank you. The next question that uh, we selected is very interesting. Um, uh, how in the world can the market and our 401ks be so high when there is tremendous economic uncertainty and unemployment? So it talks about valuation. Is there some sort of disconnect between what the market is doing and what we think might happen to the economy? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, I look at it too, and I often wonder uh, what exactly is going on, right? Um, you see so much uh, kind of economic carnage around you, but uh, the stock market doesn't reflect that. So I, I think the first thing is that the traditional thinking that the stock market is a reflection of how the overall economy uh, is doing, uh, we probably need to throw that out the window. Um, and I think all the data supports that, right? If you look at... Um, the number of people in the country that actually are invested in the stock market, uh, it's a relatively small proportion, right? Um, and I think it's also an indicator that uh, there is a significant amount of wealth that is concentrated in a relatively small amount of people, right? And so if you see the stock market going higher, those people are, are doing better, but the reality is there's a huge chunk of the population that um, isn't uh, being um, represented there, um, especially if you think about the coronavirus impact and how, you know, it's really been uh, a lot of lower wage earners that have been impacted, whether it's like the service industry, the hospitality industry. Um, so I, I think that's the first thing there. Um, I'm a believer that the economy is pretty resilient and it's going to be strong. Uh, and corporate America is just wired in a way that companies are always going to find a way to eke out a little bit more growth, a little bit more revenue, um, whether it's through automation um, or just managing um, expenses, moving into new markets. Um, my experience is that they, they always will find a way, right? Like the capitalist machine is going to keep moving. Um, and so I think that uh, it, it is high, um, but, but, you know, I'm not sure that it's going to, there's going to be a huge decline um, anytime soon. I think we'll see corrections along the way, um, but especially if the Fed continues to keep rates low, um, keeping discount rates low, boosting asset prices, um, I, I can't see it moving significantly uh, lower than where it is, um, especially if you have a Trump reelection, right? Because uh, the stock market is one of the things that he certainly looks at um, as an indicator of how the economy is doing um, and how his kind of presidency is coming along. And so he has the ability to enact policies that will continue to help the stock market, will continue to help corporations. Uh, we saw that uh, two years ago with the reduction in the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. That's a huge amount of cash that companies were able to pick up and you know, reinvest into their companies. And the reality is they, they weren't paying that to employees. I don't think any of us got paid more because of corporate tax return. Uh, but companies went out and they bought back shares and they uh, issued dividends and they reinvested in their businesses. So um, it's high. Um, it's been going high, for, going up for a very long time. Um, but I, I wouldn't bet against it. Yeah, and I think from my perspective, too, you, you should also think about like the lockdowns only really came into effect five months ago, right? So when you think about like economic cycles, right? Economic cycles usually last longer than five months. 
So I don't think we've really seen the medium and long-term effects of the current economic situation and then that going to be translated into the stock market, right? So, you know, we should also kind of keep that in mind. And, you know, just because things are going up and down or more likely up these days, doesn't really need to reflect, you know, the long-term uh, impact of the uh, economic uh, situation because there's just so much uncertainty, right? We just, no one really can put uh, a real number on what that is going to be. But, you know, I think you, you have seen a lot of economic indicators go up recently, which, you know, retail sales, you got manufacturing going up, uh, which is all positive signs, which is, you know, bringing confidence back to the market, you know, which is adding to the gains. Um, there's actually a, a really good article that I read on Bloomberg by uh, Matt Levine, and uh, he had this thing called the boredom markets hypothesis, where he says that regular people are going to trade more because they find trading entertaining, and then the alternate activities that they have are less entertaining because everyone's locked down. And if you look at like these apps and stuff like uh, Robinhood and Thinkorswim or these other ones, like trading is very, very easy and it's almost fun. And in most cases, there's no fees for transactions and stuff. And I've already had a few of my friends already call, call me and ask me for like individual stock recommendations. And I'm not in a position to really offer that, but you know, that hypothesis really seems to kind of check out on my end as well. So, you know, I think retail investing probably has a hand in driving up the market as well. So summarizing, uh, I think, uh, you could also say that the you know the inf the in there is a, such a increase in information technology you know disruptive technology that is really changing the economy and plus fundamentally you think the companies are really sound you know there are there are pockets that are uh, having trouble but overall uh, there is confidence that these companies are going to do well in terms of their earnings and their growth potential right that's what I take it. Um, so, um, with that, uh, let's move on to the next question that we selected from the long list of questions. Um, and uh, it boils down to what you see in terms of the deal flows that you both see. Uh, the question is, how is M&A action affected by the pandemic? Uh, are you noticing larger companies trying to be more aggressive during these times? And I wanted to add also in terms of uh, the premium that the companies pay um, to acquire. Do you see any trend in that premium, whether it's gone up or gone down? What do you think? Yeah, I think generally the trend we've seen is that uh, bigger companies certainly um, are in a position to be more acquisitive. And I think a lot of that is driven by the fact that bigger companies are better capitalized um, and they're built better to um, go through different business cycles. Uh, and so because of that, when, when a downturn like this happens, um, they're able to um, move strategically in a way that um, smaller companies can't. Um, I think generally though, everyone is a little bit cautious, all right? Um, people are wondering what the long-term effects are gonna be um, of kind of coronavirus, the pandemic um, on the economy going forward how it's gonna change the way we do business, how it might change their business models. Um, and so they're, they're waiting for some clarity on that, um, it seems. Um, deals that were in the pipeline um, are moving at a slower pace in terms of um, kind of the path towards execution. Um, and I think there's a lot more due diligence around um, deals that companies were uh, considering before. Um, so I, I think that the MLA pipeline is still going to be good um, we've certainly seen it pick up in the last month relative to where it was three months ago. Um, but I think people are sort of cautiously, um, you know, uh, proceeding, um, trying to be strategic and um, trying to take advantage of, of the current dynamics, but um, not taking, you know, significant risks. Okay. Um, from, from my perspective, um, you know, some of my M&A processes were put on hold during the COVID outbreak, um, but now I'm starting to see them pick up again. So generally, like when it comes to my project finance deals, uh, they usually take about a year for execution, maybe sometimes shorter or longer, depending on the project. 
Um, so, but I think it's important to keep in mind that there was like a market instability in the background, but, you know, as a junior, um, we're still structuring and pitching deals, right? It's, there's no like pencils down, like coronavirus is happening. Like, you know, we, we're not doing anything, right? There's still, you still have a deal and it still needs to be structured and you need to plan it as if, you know, going forward, there will be a window for execution. And I think that's the approach that uh, some of my uh, coworkers were taking. So I think, you know, there's a broad acknowledgement in the processes that I've been involved in that things would slow down, right? But, you know, as you adjust to the work from home environment uh, and things like that, but the idea is that, you know, keep working on it. And then once there's a window for execution, then, you know, we're definitely going to do it. And, you know, I think that's what you saw in a lot of bond deals. Um, also, uh, when I was working on a couple of them back in March, uh, in February, where, you know, we were structuring them, and then all of a sudden, we were supposed to execute um, during like the March timeframe, and, you know, the window just isn't open, right? And then we said, okay, like, let's keep it, you know, let's keep it warm. Let's keep it, you know, uh, structuring it and see if we can think creatively about it. And then, you know, there was a window um, last month and we were able to execute. Um, and I think that's kind of the approach that people have been uh, taking. Good, thank you. I know both of you um, have exposure to the fixed income derivatives and uh, FX. And uh, what do you, uh, what do you, what trends do you see um, in the U.S. fixed income market now? And uh, if you can forecast, uh, will happen uh, post-COVID? Yeah, I can, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so the fixed income market is interesting, right? You had a, a pretty big decline in, in rates. Um, I think rates are going to stay depressed for some time. Um, there's a lot of factors that we're looking at. Um, the first is just relative kind of supply and demand, all right? Um, you, uh, you have extremely low rates in Europe and a lot of different parts of the world. And so that by definition is gonna create um, demand for dollar rates, right? Even though US interest rates are, are low on a relative basis, they're still um, pretty attractive. Um, the thing that's gonna be interesting to see is uh, some of the government spending, right? Um, so we have to pay for uh, the stimulus packages, we have to pay for uh, tax reform. And I think regardless of which administration comes into place next go around, um, you're gonna see additional spending, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare. And so um, one of the things that we're focused on is just the long-term implications of just additional, of a bigger deficit, additional spending by the government um, what that means for the for the uh, U, for U.S. Treasuries, um, and then also as you start to see growth out of Europe, I think there's a chance that um, the U.S. dollar um, starts to lose a little bit of ground to the euro in terms of its reserve currency status. And so, if people start pulling out of USD, um, that's also going to have uh, some implications for uh, what we see in the fixed income market going forward. From, from my standpoint on infrastructure deals that require financing, there's usually like a bank financing you could do or a bond financing, right? So we look at both of those trends. And in my opinion, I think you're starting to see banks become more selective on credit quality and the opportunities to pursue uh, compared to the pre-COVID. So things are starting to open up slowly now, um, but you're starting to see a little bit more hesitation in the bank market because again, you know, banks look at, lending as a way of, you know, looking for the worst case scenario and trying to understand what that could be and then applying it to their own lending benchmarks. Um, so there, I think you've been seeing a little bit more hesitation, but in the investment grade bond market, which is over, which is over a trillion dollars right now in supply so far this year, um, it's been really, really strong because you've seen investors still want to put money to work and, you know, coronavirus is still in the background, but, you know, if you're, if you're an investor and you're sitting on a lot of cash, like you're not just going to wait and, until the pandemic is over to start investing. You, I think you're still going to want to keep investing throughout the, the months. So, you know, from that perspective, it's been uh, pretty strong. 
And again, you know, f- only five months removed from the lockdowns in March, right? So I think the future is still, you know, unpredictable with COVID and the elections adding to the uncertainty of what, you know, how the markets for both bank and bond could uh, go going forward. But at least in recent months, you definitely see the in, uh, the bond market um, really pick up. Thank you. Thank you. At the next question uh, related to pandemic, um, could uh, very interesting question by the way. Could social distancing and stay-at-home measures uh, have any effect on economic behaviors permanently? Um, and the follow-up is: uh, Is a remote workforce more productive? Uh, another follow-up is, uh, do you see uh, any psychological damage from remote working? Very interesting. So uh, can you please respond to this? Yeah, I'll start with uh, remote working. Um, we've had an interesting um, uh, sort of experience with remote working. So um, the majority of the people that I work with um, have entered into some type of uh, into a situation where they're working from home for some part of the time uh, and working in the office for some part of the time. Um, it sort of varies based on that person's individual circumstance. Um, I was in the office until the middle of April um, and then I stayed home for about five or six weeks and then I came back um, right after Memorial Day. Um, and so what I've found is that uh, I am uh, less productive when I work from home. Uh, it takes me a little bit longer to get stuff done. Um, and uh, because of that, I end up working more hours because at the end of the day, I still have to get the same amount of work done. Um, I also uh, was probably getting fatigued more uh, because I didn't have any separation between work and my personal life. And I think that's especially compounded in uh, New York City, where you're in these apartments that you really never intended to spend a lot of time in. It's just supposed to be a place for you to, you know, rest in between exploring the city and working. And so uh, not having a lot of space and, and just being confined to that space uh, wasn't a good combination. So I've actually enjoyed coming back to the office. Um, I'm working out of the Brooklyn office, which, and I live in Brooklyn, so it's about a 30 minute walk round trip. Um, We've gone through uh, a lot of, uh, we've implemented a lot of technology to make sure that we're just as connected and we try to be as productive as possible. Um, in a trading floor environment, there's constant interaction. You're shouting over to a trader, you're shouting over to a salesperson, you're one of your colleagues, uh, you have the client on the line. And there's a lot of um, really just sort of immediate communication that happens. And so to sort of replicate that, we have a persistent Zoom call um, throughout the day. And so if somebody has a question on something, we can shout over. If a line calls and we need to see if someone's available, we just shout into the Zoom call. Um, so we tried to replicate it as much as possible with technology, but it, it's definitely not as, uh, as efficient. And the other thing that we worry about too is uh, uh, controls. Uh, so uh, when we have our, our junior staff actually does a lot of our trade execution uh, and they're dealing with a lot of risk, right? Sometimes uh, it could be a situation where if they're a basis point off, there's a million dollar differential, right, in terms of uh, a gain or a loss. And so uh, it's very important for us to just be, to communicate a lot and to see what they're doing. Um, and so that certainly helps in terms of being in the office. So we, we try not to work from home. I think um, it, it's not a culture, I think, that we want to adopt. I don't think it's going to be um, kind of a persistent, ongoing thing that, that, that's changed in the sales and trading industry. I think everyone's going to be uh, in the office, but there's going to be a little bit more leniency to work from home than there was before. From, uh, from my perspective in, in uh, banking, it's, uh, I, I think I've been pretty, pretty productive, um, and, I, and I like it. And the reason is because you know, I tend to get more sleep now, now that I'm at home and uh, there's no real commute time wasted. And I feel like there's way less distractions. Right. But I think to uh, Abu's point is that he, he has a lot more systems and interaction that he needs in his day to day. Whereas me on the banking side, I don't really need that. I don't, I don't really have like a Bloomberg that I need to use on a day to day. And I, and I really don't need 
uh, to be talking to people constantly throughout the day to get my work done, right? Like it, it could be very silent. It's not totally siloed off, but there's a lot of like independent work done uh, on my end, which is, uh, which is different. Um, for me personally, you know, it, it was important for me to invest in my own at home work ex- station, right? You know, no one can work on a laptop, right? And there was people who were trying to get that done, but it's, uh, it's very, very difficult. So, you know, on the last day of the office, which was back in late March, I just took a picture of all my equipment and just bought it. And now I have like a good system at home, which makes me productive. Right. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the key part is that, you know, I want to make sure my productivity is keeping up there. Uh, you know, I, I am in a, I am in a studio, as you can see uh, in my background <laughs> and, uh, it's a small studio. So being locked up in a studio for, you know, four months, isn't the most ideal thing. Uh, I'm actually live with my girlfriend too. So <laughs> it's two people in this small space. Um, and again, you know, the, the idea was that I'm just supposed to sleep here and then just go to work for most of the day. Right. So it is a real big change. Um, and I think what's really bothers me from my perspective is I really feel plugged in 24 seven, right? Because before when I was just answering emails on my phone, there was like some kind of distance I had, right? You could just quickly answer like a quick question on your phone. And then, you know, you're, you, if you just throw your phone away, you're like completely removed from the office. But here, you know, you got your whole workstation in the background and, you know, you got your phone on you as well. It just feels like you're always surrounded by work, you know, 24 seven. Um, so I think our group is trying to mitigate that because it's, it, they understand that's the case for a lot of the juniors. And, you know, they've been saying, you gotta take vacation, you gotta just unplug, you gotta go do something different, like get out of your apartment and go like, go somewhere. Um, but you know, if there's a lot of work, there's only so much you can do, but there's been a real big priority in saying like, you need to like, go do something to remove yourself. So, you know, what I do when I try to unwind a bit is, you know, watch some basketball, TV shows, something to take my mind off of, you know, a computer screen. But, uh, but, you know, eventually I'll definitely need to kind of uh, take a vacation outside the city or something. Yeah, I agree. It's the separation of work life and personal life that really is an issue. Um, <clears throat> so the next question, um, uh, we really needed more time to discuss this, but uh, I want to hear your thoughts. Um, I, it has to, uh, it relates to the, uh, the huge social unrest crisis that we have in response to uh, systemic uh, racism and racial injustice. Uh, we often wonder um, how, how is, been, how's the Wall Street responding to this issue? And in particular, how has that impacted your workplace? And also as a person of colors, you know, how it has impacted you personally? So very interested to know your thoughts on that issue. Yeah, I, I can start with that. Um, and like you said, we don't have enough time today to really do the topic justice, but I can touch on some of my experiences I've had over the last uh, four or five months. Um, so I think it really all started right with uh, the murder of George Floyd and the Amy Cooper incident um, here in Central Park. Um, and I don't think historically there has been a lot of uh, conversation in the workplace about these issues. I think the traditional thinking is that um, these are sort of divisive or political or controversial issues. And so generally people have avoided them. Um, and so for me, like when all of that happened, I was in Brooklyn, I was protesting, um, and I remember coming into work and I would hear people kind of talking about the protests, um, and, uh, referencing in a way, referencing them in a way that I thought was just too casual, um, and not appreciative of, uh, the impact of everything that was going on. Um, and, and that was a little bit frustrating for me. And so... Um, I got to a point where I was like, you know what, I, I think we need to get the ball rolling and, and, and start having conversations on this. And I was inspired by um, some of my friends and the conversations that they were having in their workplace. And so I, I wrote an email to my colleagues um, just explaining to them how I felt, right? How, you know, the killing of George Floyd made me angry and how I worry about my siblings, cousins, nieces and nephews and, um, you know, how they're going to navigate this world. Um, I talked about Amy Cooper, 
Um, and that's an interesting one, right? Because Amy Cooper worked in financial services. And so she could have been my colleague, right? And so, you know, made me and a lot of other people think about kind of how we're viewed at work. Um, it's a place where we invest a lot of time and energy into. And so like what biases might someone have towards me that, you know, they might not be showing in the workplace, um, but that comes out in other parts of their life or that they're showing, um, you know, not overtly, right? And so a lot of that can take like a heavy emotional and mental toll. And so in the email, I explained that, you know, having these conversations allows us to learn from each other, understand each other better, uh, and show that we care about each other, right? And JP Morgan wants to be a more inclusive place. Um, this makes all of us better teammates. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the diversity and inclusion piece, I think a lot of times people focus on diversity, but not as much inclusion. And I think part of inclusion is, is having these conversations. And so after I sent that email, I, I had a lot of conversations, uh, more than I expected. Uh, some were inspirational. You know, I, I talked to people who had taken the time to educate themselves on the issues and who are passionate about trying to make the world a better place, right? They understand that we're still seeing the effects of slavery, Jim Crow, Jim Crow segregation, redlining. Uh, and so that gave me a lot of hope that collectively we'll, we'll find a path forward. Uh, and then I had some conversations that were honestly draining. Um, you know, I find myself explaining to people that racism still exists in the world, uh, even if they are not black and even if they don't see it uh, in their life. Um, you know, I had people tell me that, you know, their children have black friends and as long as people are raised to be nice to each other, the world will be a better place. Uh, and and I'm, I'm trying to explain to them like, yeah, you know, we should all be nice to each other, but it, it's a lot more complicated than that. You know, we're talking about inequities in terms of education, the financial system, professionally. Um, I, I don't really want people to be nice to me. You know, I want us to analyze the data and see what we can do to make it such that, you know, the average net worth for a black family isn't 17K while it's 170K for a white family, right? I want the public schools in Dorchester and Roxbury to be just as good as the public schools in, in Newton and Wellesley. You know, if like a pregnant black mother goes to have a delivery, I want her to have the same chances of having a safe delivery as a white pregnant mother, right? I think all of these things are things that we should all want, um, but it, it, it takes a lot of mental energy to have a lot of these conversations. And in addition, and all of this is happening in addition to the markets uh, going through a lot of turmoil and, and work being uh, extremely busy. So, so that, that was a tough time, um, but I think there were a lot of productive conversations and I, and I think it was, it was worth it. Um, and then in terms of JP Morgan, I think the company does a good job of setting the right framework um, to achieve results in terms of diversity, inclusion, and equity, right? Um, I think the biggest issue is that once this framework is set, there's not anybody there to hold leadership accountable uh, and to make sure that they don't take their eye off the ball. Um, and I think across Wall Street, we're seeing companies put measures in place to, to increase accountability, whether it's making bonuses, um, tied to diversity goals. Um, before, I think they were sort of a soft target. Now, now they're a hard target, right? Your compensation is going to be determined based on whether or not you hit these uh, goals. And so um, there's a lot more effort and energy that goes into it. Um, with the, the strategy that we've taken within sales and trading here is that we have uh, uh, created a position for someone to advocate for the black community right, within sales and trading. And so their job is not to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of other good things that JP Morgan is already doing. Uh, their job is to think of ways to supplement and support what the institution is already doing in order to make sure that we're best in class in terms of achieving these goals, not just at JP Morgan, but across Wall Street. So for instance, in terms of hiring, one of the things that we always hear is, you know, there's not enough black talent out there, right? Which to a certain extent makes sense because um, you think about the number of people who are graduating from college, the number of people who are going into finance, like it, it makes sense there is no, there, there is not a strong pool there. But with that said, right, whenever we're competing against another bank, we have an intensity and a rigor um, for business that uh, we want to win. We don't care what happens to another bank. And so uh, it, I'm imploring people to have that same intensity and rigor when they're going after talent, right? Uh, if you want to get to a point where your candidates are 50% women, go after them, right? There shouldn't be any excuses. And so the same thing, if you want your 
um, population uh, of interns to be 15% black, then we have to have a culture where there's no excuses and we're going out and we're getting the best talent. And if it means that Morgan Stanley or Bank of America or anyone else doesn't have the best talent, then that's their problem. But at JP Morgan, we need to make sure that uh, we are winning and going after this with the same intensity that we go after M&A deals or buy side or sell side deal, whatever it is, right? Um, so in, in general, I think a lot of the right things are being done. Um, it's gonna be a matter of um, just focus and intensity going forward to make sure that, um, you know, the, 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 you know, people don't take their eye off the ball. Okay. From, from my side, um, I, I consider myself, I guess, fortunate to be working in the project finance field because it's, it's largely an international field. Um, project finance transactions, like the U.S. makes mo the majority of them, but there's a huge market in Latin America, Asia, the Middle East, and we and a lot of those deals actually come out in, in our region, in, in our group. So in, in turn, our, our group is quite diverse. You know, I think half of us are born in the States and the other half is born elsewhere, outside. Um, and I think this diversity is a huge benefit in how we work on things. And different backgrounds really foster different ways of thinking. And it's, it's such a, it's really, really important, right? Because I know my director, he was born in uh, Turkey and he grew up in Turkey. And he has this way of thinking based on the way he grew up. And it's very much like problem solving and very like detail oriented in terms of like, he sees a problem and he tries to think of many solutions and how to do it. And that's just the way, you know, over, you know, over his life is how he's been. Right. And it's so important to the deals that we work on that we have somebody like that. And for me personally, I think it's, I think it's super important to have that kind of diversity. So it just fosters, you know, this kind of uh, better thinking uh, because you don't want everyone to be, the same as you, you don't want everybody to be thinking exactly the same as you, and you don't want everybody to have the same background as you when you work on a deal. You want some diversity um, in it, and I think our deals um, benefit from that. And I'm not saying that our group is by any means insulated from you know racial injustice and everything like that. By no means, that's not the case. Um, but this discussion comes up a lot over in our group, and we're not afraid to have it. And we're not afraid to, you know, think about how we can do better uh, in this approach. Um, so I think, you know, as, as Abu said, I think uh, the JP Morgan's is trying to build off on that and, you know, they need to be more aggressive and, you know, hopefully we see some results going forward. Good, thank you. And as I mentioned, we needed more time to discuss this issue at a much deeper level, but uh, moving on, uh, we have a uh, question, uh, two questions basically on the recruiting. Um, with the current economic trend, um, does it impact the rate at which the bank hires from uh, non-target school? Does it really go down? And the follow-up question is that um, with companies moving start dates to 2021, how will, it that, how will that impact uh, future hiring decisions? Yeah, I can touch on that a little bit. I was heavily uh, involved in the JP Morgan recruiting efforts uh, this past year, um, and then also in the internship program that um, that just concluded. So the first thing I will say is that JP Morgan actually didn't push any start dates out. Um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of banks actually kept their start dates the same. Um, we have a pretty big pool of talent. Um, and if there's one thing we know is that there's going to be uh, attrition, right? People are going to leave. They're going to go to other opportunities. Um, I had an analyst last year who was uh, extremely good, and he ended up leaving to uh, go back to Iowa to uh, teach swimming. He, he swam at Iowa and wants to get into the sports business. And so, like, people have varied interests, and so we're always going to need a new pool of talent. And so I think it's important for us to always have um, to always be hiring uh, analysts coming in. So I don't think from a recruiting perspective, um, the number of people uh, that we have is going to, is going to change. Um, and then in terms of non-target schools versus target schools, I think I've seen a shift in general away from target schools to being more open 
um, and looking at candidates, not necessarily based on who they're referred by um, or where they go to school, but just on what their natural ability is. Um, and so we're, we've certainly done that and we've seen it in the numbers. Um, so I think that trend is one that existed before COVID and I think will continue. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think COVID will have much of an impact on kind of the way that we, we continue to, to recruit talent. And then maybe I could quickly add that I, I actually worked with our intern this year um, and he was all remote. Um, so it was like the first time we had something like this and it was a pretty interesting experience, but you can see that JP Morgan put a ton of thought into the program in such a short amount of time um, and really try to drive like the training aspect of the internship and then working on the desk with us. Uh, so there was a lot of, structural thought behind it, even though it was all virtual. And um, I think, you know, the major thing is that we try to convey in our group is got to constantly maintain interaction with the interns and, you know, always get on the phone with them, Zoom calls and everything. So uh, I think it turned out to be pretty well, given the circumstances. I know the intern, the, uh, intern was very happy with the program. Um, and I think it's been a pretty good year just given you know where things are um because of coronavirus i think you're on mute i think sorry. that's the line in 2020. thank you um sorry about that again uh this is also related to uh recruiting um and the uh, question is, um, we all know investment banking and Wall Street jobs that are very, very competitive, hard to find, hard to get. So uh, what specific advice can you give to our students uh, so that you know, they become uh, more competitive in terms of getting internships and jobs in the asset management and investment banking? And in particular, how does a resume stand out in a crowded field? So uh, floor is yours. Yeah, I, um, the advice I always give in terms of standing out is uh, really to do your research and to make sure that you know what you're talking about, right? Um, these, these internships are very competitive. You go to a super day um, and you have, you know, 30 minutes with a bunch of different people and, and that, day is basically going to determine, you know, whether or not this is a future, uh, a, a, a job at this company is going to be available to you. And so I think you need to be, you need to be very crisp, you need to be concise, and you need to be able to articulate um, what you're interested in, why you're interested in it. And I think in order to do that, you really have to understand the different parts of finance, right? You have to understand the difference between investment banking and, and sales and trading the difference between debt capital markets and equity capital markets. And you need to be able to speak intelligently to them. Um, and not a lot of people are able to, but there, there are a handful of people that we run into who are able to tell us exactly where they wanna be and why. And maybe it's because they have family that are in industry, maybe a, a father or a mother, maybe an older brother or a sister, um, but those are the people that you're going up against. And so. I think it's very, very important for you to really study, really understand the different parts of the field um, and figure out where, what you're interested in, uh, what lines up with your natural skill set, um, and try to get into a place where you're, you're best able to succeed. Yeah. And then I would just add on that, like, to, to your point, like, you know, make sure the preparation also keep in mind who you're interviewing with and their background, right? If you can get information on that, because if someone comes up to me and, you know, answers all my technical questions, then yes, you know, you've done a great job. But if you're able to kind of talk a little bit about infrastructure and the news going behind it, you know, that means that you've done your research and that uh, that is quite impressive to me, right? So, you know, if you're going for an oil and gas job or something like that, and you say all the right things in terms of the technical questions, but then you say, oh, but by the way, I think, you know, here's my thoughts on the oil market going forward because of X, Y, Z, then I think it makes you really stand out then uh, in the interview process. And people really like that because that means you did your research. Um, and then the second thing is like, if there's anything I could tell you guys, you, 
please get good grades. <laughs> I mean, it's really, really important. Like you, I know that you'll all be applying to the same jobs and it's extremely competitive out there. And the first thing when people come out of school, the thing they look at is, you know, what's your GPA, right? And then they look at like internship experience and this and that, right? So if you have a low, you know, if you don't have a great uh, GPA, uh, which I did, it is extremely hard to work up into the world and into the career because you have that going against you at all times and you have to continually pr prove yourself. So if you can get a good GPA and maintain it, it does you wonders in the recruitment process because at least people will check that box for you. But, you know, it's, it's, that's why I, said, I think it's super important to keep studying and at least from your end, you know, be able to check the box that you've, you know, you've done your work and you're performing well in school. Yeah, yes. I, I agree with that 100%. Um, I'll tell you guys how I read uh, resumes. So I pretty much look at GPA and then I look at interests. All right. And I say, okay, is, and, and it's not necessarily an indicator of anything, but I'm like, okay, is this person smart? Okay. Yep. They got good grades. That means they're smart. They can work hard. Uh, and are they interesting? You know, like, like what, what do they like to do? You know, like, and um, pretty much through that, like you just filter through resumes, right? You get so many resumes that come in that you need a quick and easy way to filter it down. And so res, uh, the, the GPA is just a very, very important thing. Um, and then on top of that, just experiences, right? Um, try to get as many high quality experiences as you can. Um, if I had to, I mean, it's tough, right? If I had to choose someone with good experiences and a low, low GPA versus someone with a high GPA and not as good experiences, I, if I had to choose, I'd probably still go with the high GPA, right? So th there's no, and everyone is different on that. And so that's part of the, the game here is that you don't know who's looking at your resume and what they value, um, but definitely high GPA, good experiences, good interests, um, try to get as much of that as possible. Okay. Um... That's that's an excellent point. Um, I do want to mention that uh, many of my students have done well. Uh, you know, it's a it's a lot of hard work, but uh, going into asset management uh, or any good job, um, uh, good GPA is very important. Uh, but it's just the entire package, you know, you have to prepare. You know, so that's what I think. You and do, uh, what I did, which is which is start off college with a really good GPA, like work really hard freshman and sophomore year. Uh, get an internship uh, mm -hmm. and then watch your GPA slowly decline through the rest of your, your academic career. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, just very quickly, Abu Bakr, I think um, you're also doing a class uh, or a preparation mentoring a number of students at Bentley, right? How's that going? Uh, are, Naveen, you're also involved with that or? Uh, yeah, no, Naveen is going to be involved. We're going to get him <laughs> to help. Sorry. Out the classes this year. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're calling it the Wall Street Boot Camp. And um, back to the points that we made earlier, it's really just about helping students really understand what the industry about. I think there are certain terms that people hear that, you know, sound cool or sound sexy that uh, people really don't understand uh, what it's about, right? Like the life of an analyst is not glamorous, right? Sounds cool, but it's a lot of grind work. It's a lot of hours. And so um, and I think it's important for people to understand like what they're getting into. What's the difference between being an analyst in sales and trading and being an analyst in, in M&A, right? Um, and I think also a lot of people are focused on investment banking, but not necessarily focused on sales and trading, restructuring, um, capital markets, like other places where there are a lot of good skill sets to, to be learned and a lot of good experiences to be had. Um, so it's about making them more well-rounded so that when they have these discussions, when they're going into interviews, um, they uh, uh, know what they're talking about, but then also getting them connected to uh, Bentley alum who are working on Wall Street and who can help them potentially get jobs at their institutions or, or just, you know, really serve as mentors to them. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, Naveen, do you want to respond or uh, now that I have... <laughs> well, I guess now I'm part of the program now. So, <laughs> welcome. No, I think I think um, it's amazing. It's so we are so very appreciative of the fact that you're giving back to Bentley. You know, I mean, this is an incredible opportunity for our students to be connected, and so 
when is the next batch? Uh, when are you still making the selection for the next batch? Uh, it's going to be in the next month or so. We're going to be working with um, with Student Affairs to uh, send out a notification to the students to um, start to build a pool of applicants. Yeah, I feel like I want to apply to one of these jobs too, you know. So, uh, but uh, you know, all seriousness, uh, uh, thank you, Abu Bakr and Naveen, uh, for giving us um, really a very uh, privileged and inside view of how Wall Street is responding to the the social, economic, political uncertainties and crises. You know, um, I, it's uh, it's a uh, we really cannot tell you how much we appreciate your thoughtful, your personal views on these issues. And uh, again, must apologize for not having enough time to properly address these defining issues at a much deeper level. And, uh, and also uh, in this point, I also want to thank the audience for submitting questions. And, uh, and, in, and now I'd like to invite Emily to formally wrap up the session. Well, I can't say any more than you already did. We are so appreciative of all of your time and giving back to Bentley and staying connected and um, hopefully giving any students who are still on some good tips on how to improve their grades and their resumes. Um, thank you guys again so much. And we hope that you all enjoyed today's program. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.